my ear. Hello there, good morning, and welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Neota Ebe. Sometimes the voices change, but the program <laughs> remains the same. Good morning and welcome. I'm Mal Welby, Yusuf. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the program. I'm Ayo Makinde. Well, so much is happening and has happened and is happening in our country. Sometimes it's really difficult to put your hands or your fingers on one issue at any given point in time. Uh, one of the things that often comes to my mind, guys, is um, what are the duties of, uh, of a citizen? What are the things that we're expected to do as, in, as a people? The um, judgments of last week and the, all of the build up into the elections and the post election has only, you know, revealed so many things more and more to us about ourselves. But then I, I continue to ask the question when are we going to bond as a people? When are we going to bond as one? What are the things we can do to restore patriotism? A major thing that comes to my mind is. That comment, you know, credited to the Minister of Information and National Orientation. I'm just wondering how we're going to get around that national orientation issue where people know what is expected to them, of them. People uh, can identify we before me. People can put Nigeria first as opposed to anything else. How do we get to that point where, be it at the bank or at the train station or at the, at the airport, the bus station, it's others first before me. Is there a way we can integrate emotional intelligence into our lives in such a way that we empathize with others before we are so particular about ourselves? The difficulty is that the reality is in our faces of poverty, of social economic uh, pressure, on people, the buying power reducing, makes it all the more difficult. Yes, people are celebrating, and of course we should. The fact that Nigeria, uh, the, the Naira appreciated slightly over the dollar, uh, you know, in the past few days. Glad as that could make us, you know, uh, feel celebrated, celebrated as that should be. How long before we get to the point where we put others before us, nation before self, Nation before region, nation before state, nation before tribe, nation before religion. It's the only thing that bothers my mind this morning, Chamberlain, beg your pardon, Neota and Mokwe. <laughs> um, I, uh, it's a good thing they had that mix, Chamberlain, <laughs> Neota and Mokwe. It's a good thing. Chamberlain's here in the spirit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, when, when we talk about this, these issues about when we would um, ha put the nation first, uh, some people will say, where's the pride in our nation? At what point do we begin to say, okay, this is what we stand for as a nation? If, there's, if you're not standing for anything, as some will say, you stand for nothing. So we need to go back again to look at where we stand as a nation. But before we look at what we stand for as a nation, the question is, where do you as an individual stand? Um, I was talking to my mentor yesterday, and he said something. He said, before you look at the bigger picture of what's happening and how everybody else is not doing the right thing, what are you doing in your little space? How are you changing that little space where you are for the good that you seek? So imagine that you are doing your bit. I'm doing my bit. We sit there on Eco Africa, doing your bit for the environment. You're doing your bit. I'm doing my bit, Marpa is doing her bit, and even our viewers there right now are doing their bit for our nation. Guess what will happen? We will all come together at a certain point and we'll be going somewhere. Simple, simple example. You get to a traffic light. You know the red light says stop. You don't wait. You're jumping it. And sometimes you say it's the, those that are, that are ignorant, that are not educated, that do this. But you actually get there, you see the big man. Educated ones, jumping a red light, as simple as a red light. Or you get to somewhere where, there, where there's a queue. You know you should join the queue. But because you feel like you are who you think you are, you jump that queue. And then tomorrow you'll be wondering, why are things not working? In your space, what are you doing? So before we begin to talk about what does the nation stand for, when do we get to that point where we put the nation first, when would the nation put me first? Before you get to that point, when would you... Put the other man first. When would you put the nation first? Okay. Are we up? 
And I, I want to believe this is a spillover from Sunday. And it happens. <laughs> and interestingly, I mean, for those of us who are Christians, um, yes, well, if you're a Christian and you went to church, uh, it's still Monday. So if you went to church and the sermon, you know, really touched you, uh, today is a great day to start to leave it out. And who best to remind us uh, than the two gentlemen that we have here as to how it actually relates to our daily life. Isn't that what religion, isn't that what faith should be all about in terms of how we live it um, in our daily life? Even for those who do not practice any faith, uh, those who say they don't even believe in God, they believe in, in, in good and evil, they believe in right and wrong, they believe in injustice, they believe in certain principles. How much more those of us uh, who profess some faith some faith, who we'll profess, you know, some religion. People have always asked how it is that we are some of the most religious people on earth. I mean, if you go, if you come to Nigeria and you look at our figures in terms of what religions we profess and the population of, or the demography of our religion, that, uh, of, our, of our population that professes these religion, this faith, you have to ask, then why are they like this? Why are they still where they are? Why is it that nobody trusts anybody? Uh, oftentimes, you find that, that people don't stop at traffic lights because they don't trust that the next person is going to stop. And even when <laughs> I remember my light was green and I still had to wait for another car to pass, uh, it, it was instinctive. You know, I, I will still, you will still go carefully. Because mm -hmm. you didn't know, say, so the light is green and then you, you, you exactly. speed over. You still will look... Right and left. Give way to traffic on your left. That's what. <laughs> before you, before you run over, <laughs> and then you you start speaking English. Oh, that song again. But speaking more seriously, because these are not matters to joke with in terms of making an impact in your direct space. Um, that's what we do here in our own direct space. This is what we can do. Uh, this is what we can do. We can we can ask you each day to think about it. We can ask you so. We are doing our own bit here, uh, and this is what we do. We bring you the news, we analyze the news, we bring people who break it down to us, we bring people who inspire us, we bring people who motivate us, we bring people who tell our leaders just how bad things are. Um, and we tell you when things are going okay in certain directions, we tell you when they're not going so okay. So this is our own little bit. In our own personal spaces, yes, with them, I mean, there's so much more. When I listen to what some people are doing, I mean, the magnificent things they're doing in their spaces, I'm, I, I'm challenged, I'm motivated, even with the meager resources, sometimes absolutely no resources, which they, which they even take on projects that they have decided to take on. I'm asking myself, uh, what, what precisely is my excuse? You know, so um, really, I really want us to ask ourselves those personal questions. When the United Nations sets is it 30 uh, SDGs, 30, yeah, development goals? I'm trying to find the, what the S means. Yeah. Is this special? What about now? You're you looking for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the SDGs, I mean, they want to end poverty. They want to end hunger. They want to end uh, a lack of education. They want to end uh, all manner of things that they want to end by the year 2030. Oftentimes, we think that those are some broad, um, idealistic goals. But the truth of the matter is that if we all put our heads down and ask in my own little space that I can influence, how is it that I am helping to put an end to these things? Am I concerned about it enough? Or am I too consumed in my own wants, my own needs, my own, my own, my own, my own, that I have no time whatsoever to spare uh, for that person who might not even be measuring up to, uh, up to me. Um, these are questions that we should critically ask of ourselves and ask of ourselves, how can we live lives of impact? How can we live lives that would have been worthy of living? Um, uh, every morning when you wake up, you ask, did I leave my uh, community better than I met it yesterday? These, it might seem like it's far-fetched, but that's how people live better lives. That's how people lead lives of impact. 
that's how they make a difference. So think about it. As you go out today, um, yes, we know that we start really early. And oftentimes, I mean, I've met people who say, Malfoy, you make me late for work. It's a real pleasure to make you late for work. But I ask you today that as you go out, just think about it. Give it some thought. And, you know, I'm hoping that in our little spaces, it might take some time for us to feel the impact. Uh, because little drops of water take it some time to fill a bucket. But by all means, do add your little drop today. That's the word that I can, I, I can, and, I can add to encourage And I was you. going to just uh, quickly add in it. That S we were looking for is sustainable development sustainable goals. Sustainable development goals, <laughs> yes. I'm Talking about sustainability, I understand there's something going on at the River State House of Assembly that is not too good. An explosion brought the, the a fire incident, rather, or some say it's an explosion that happened at the River State House of Assembly. Um, we, we, we do not have the full details of that, but we'll bring you updates on that as we come. But I do understand. Ayo, you have some more details on this? Well, yeah, it's a fire that broke out at the River State House of Assembly complex. Of course, yes, you are also correct. Some people said that there was an explosion. There was actually something organized by some arsonists and all. But for now, what we have is that the fire was reported at uh, about 10 p.m. yesterday. And uh, as at that time, as at the time of filing the report, uh, the assembly complex has been taken over by security agents from the nearby command of the River State Police, uh, while a fire truck has also uh, uh, been put on ground. It's coming amidst rumors of an impending impeachment procedure against the state governor. Uh, attempts to get information from members of the House have proven ab abortive as the lawmakers have remained tight-lipped on the rumored plot. It's not yet clear if the fire is connected with the political imbroglio, but rumors of a rift between the governor and his predecessor, uh, yes, on Wike, who is now FCT minister, have been brewing for some time. What, what, I mean, it goes back to what we were saying um, you know, earlier on about this whole Nigeria first or the country first, the state first, as opposed to me first. Uh, we can only wait, you know, guys, uh, to find out exactly what this whole thing is about. If there is a rumored plot of an impeachment, then the question would be why? Uh, what exactly is there to benefit? Who loses? Who gains at the end of the day? These are the things that are important. But as, at, as we speak at this point, this has happened at the River State House of Assembly, a fire outbreak. And um, security agents are on ground now, ensuring that things are done as they should. Let's segue into the papers this morning and see what uh, the papers are saying uh, right now. Let's begin with the Guardian newspaper this morning. And what do we have on its front page? It is why probe of 11.3 trillion Naira refineries maintenance cost will end futile. Okay, remember we talked about this last week. I was saying well, exactly what is likely to come out of it. Any hopes in the horizon? Well, this report on the front page of The Guardian, details of which are on page six, will tell you uh, what the challenges are and whether or not the National Assembly will be able to conquer um, whatever the impediments are. Still on energy, energy challenges undermining Nigeria's development in Ubu admits. Find that story on page six is right beneath the picture under the major headline of the Guardian newspaper this morning. Unconstitutional for politicians to be INEC wreck. What does that mean? Details you find on page two and a number of other uh, wonderful stories that you will find interesting this morning on the front page of the Guardian newspaper. Well, we do have the Vanguard newspaper here and they're taking it from another angle. This time is to the federal government says NLC, TUC, NECA to FG halt fall in Naira value. That's what the Vanguard newspaper is leading with um, and then see the writers ask FG to take urgent actions to stabilize currency 
NLC threatens action to compel governments to prioritize rescue of Naira economy if TUC blames IMF World Bank. Pre fall of Naira worrisome, as coming from NECA. You know, Mark, with all of this um, request to the federal government, I do know that the, the institution mandated to protect the Naira is the central bank. Mm -hmm. So now to the federal government to say, stop the fall of the Naira. Or of course, oh, everything comes together at a certain point. So who's handling the money? Where the monetary policy and the fiscal policy comes together, someone says, that's where the Naira stability is assured. So <laughs> federal government, CBN, please, can we get this all sorted out real quick? But details of that you find on page five. And then you see a picture of the president and the German chancellor. The visit was yesterday that happened. Um, but below that, net foreign exchange inflow falls 54% to $7.29 billion in half quarter, first quarter of 2023. Uh, well, quite a number of stories here. By the side here, you have this one. Or your government files appeal against removal of Song. Is it Song or Song? Song or Song of, of Ogbumosho. You get details of that on page 10. Uh, we'll leave it here. Uh, but see, just before we go, the Tinubu to German leader, we want to change weak economy narratives, is on page 25. Maybe that ties into this call to the federal government to hold the fall of the Naira Valley. But that's it from the Vanguard newspaper. Well, I'll quickly go through the Abuja Inquirer for you. And uh, they have this this morning. FCTA misses IGR target for 2022. Record 76 billion Naira shortfall. There's a late story on the front page this morning. Um, well, some people will say 2022. <laughs> it's gone now. This is 2023. Will they meet their targets for 2023 is a big question. Uh, I'm talking about the FCT and the minister here and what has happened in Port Harcourt. Uh, the explosion that has happened in the River State House of Assembly. That's really something to worry about. Uh, a matter for concern. It's a developing story with whose details we will bring you um, in the course of this program as we get it and also in the course of our uh, news activities for the day. But if there is indeed a rift between the minister of the FCT and the governor of River State, uh, some people will say, isn't it a little too early in the day? It's just five months uh, since the new governor was sworn in. But if you ask, they would probably tell you that there's no rift between the governor and uh, his predecessor. That's what they will tell you. Uh, right now, there's plenty of smoke in the River State House of Assembly. And where there's Literal smoke. smoke. <laughs> <laughs> in where a there's place... smoke. Yeah. And where there's smoke, you're sure there's a fire somewhere. Of course there is a fire somewhere. <laughs> it so... may not be a big fire. Well, whatever fire it is, at the is moment it, it starts to become a literal fire. Yeah. Then we need to, be, you know, we need to show need more to than... to call in the fire service. Yes, we need to show more than a... a, a look more than... Or will I say... Cosmic look. Mm, yeah, exactly, give it more than a cursory look. And we have to pay some attention. Yeah, indeed. Because right now you have to ask, the River State House of Assembly has been damaged. It means that... Uh, members of the River State House of Assembly not might not be able to sit or if they are able to sit because we've seen them sit in other places or uh, alternatively um, you know what kind of laws will they be able to pass I mean, they stand would, someone might later go to court and say they did this they laws sat enough. without the mace or they, that was not I the, hope mace. the mace wasn't burnt that, that's that's not the original mace etc okay. etc et I think it's too early in the day for you know governance to be derailed in. And now we have to also put it in context that whatever happens in River State will most likely affect the federal capital territory as well. So maybe it's too early in the day for there to be so much distractions affecting two major cities. Uh, one of them dealing with, with a lot of Nigeria's imports and exports and also a sizable revenue of oil and gas. And the other, the seat of power, where a lot of attention needs to be paid. I hope that the two gentlemen involved uh, will find an amicable, amicable resolution to their problems, whatever they may be. Uh, 
Maybe I'm getting a little distracted because it's the Abuja Enquirer was supposed to be looking at for you this morning. But when you look at uh, the fact that Governor Oti is on the front page, you know that sometimes whatever happens in Abuja also affects the state. I mean, look at that. Oti tasks NDDC on abandoned projects in Abia. Six erosion control intervention. But that's not precisely Abuja now, is it? But hey. It is right here on the front page of the Abuja Enquirer. Kaduna refinery to be ready by Q4 2024, attributed to the federal government. We'll leave it there for the paper. And what else do we have this morning? Uh, let's return to talking. Uh, okay, well, something on the front page of the Vanguard is also referenced one way or the other on the front page of this Nigeria today. And it is also talking subsidy. Subsidy, Labour threatens to boycott meeting with FG if Minister Lalong attends. But why? Well, maybe the riders will give you a clue. Union accuses Minister of supporting illegal faction of NURTW. Plans protest in Imo over workers sack unpaid salaries as court stops action. Details you find on page two of the paper today. Right beneath that picture, NDLA arrests Hong Kong, France-bound businessmen for ingesting cocaine and heroin. Seizes six tons of skunk in five states. Details you find on page 23. I don't even know what to make of this guy, because... Uh, look at uh, the story right beside the nameplate. PNID, Nigeria would have lost one-third of its foreign reserves, says Buhari. But a statement yesterday, I guess that's the reference. The story is on page 20 of the paper this morning. Nigerians to pay 230 naira per kilogram for gas-powered vehicles. Um, is that a relief or what? The details you'll find on page 20 of this Nigeria newspaper today, among other stories. That's this Nigeria news this morning. The lead leadership newspaper is the next one here, and they focused on the situation at the judiciary. The so depletion of justices, CJN moves to fill 11 Supreme Court vacancies. You find details of that on page four. There have been multiple calls for the completion of the list of 21 justices. But see the writers, NJC may pick from among 10 Court of Appeal justices for six not central Southeast slots. And then the other one, Apex Court needs a full list of 21 justices. Oh, let's hope that gets done real quick. But above that, again, FG, Labour meet on palliatives today. It's again on page four. But see this, Nigeria loses billions of Naira to 70 Lagos Abidjan checkpoints. Between Lagos and Abidjan, 70 checkpoints. And here, Nigeria loses billions of naira to those checkpoints. What are the checkpoints there for? Who's manning the checkpoints? Police, customs? Who? Abidjan, is that? Right. Abidjan, that's Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so, on the road connecting Nigeria to Cote d'Ivoire, 70 checkpoints. Are they counting that of other countries, or is it just that of Nigeria? Yeah. The question is, between Lagos and Bene, mm -hmm. I think Bene is a, or is it Bene? Yes, yeah. Bene is the closest. Bene is, Bene is uh, next door, yeah, next right door. next door. Between Lagos and Bene, I understand there are well over 20 checkpoints. And that's, and Lagos, you know Lagos to Bene, it's just about approximately two, three hours. And maybe less or a little bit more. I should know, right? <laughs> you should know because you're just next you're, door. You're asking <laughs> That's me. That's why I'm to looking at that, you. So you. please confirm. <laughs> but between, let's just say Badagri, between Lagos and Badagri, mm -hmm. there are well over 10 checkpoints. Between, I don't know what you mean by between Lagos and Badagri. Badagri is in Lagos. So what do you mean? Is it, are you counting it as I'm not another Lagos state, state. I'm you Lagos mean island? Lagos, uh, mainland, mainland. Lagos, mainland, uh, and Badagri. You have to be more specific, okay. please. Because it's your community. <laughs> but just counting that alone and what goes on at those checkpoints, the question is what goes on at those checkpoints? What are they checking for? Mm -hmm. Those checkpoints, first time, man hours, and then 
whatever else happens there. We need to get clarity on that. So well, indeed, billions yeah. is lost yeah. on that access. So go to page seven to get more details. And above the name plate, you have this adult story about the uh, Ohinoi of Ibira land that passed on and the president and other northern Nigerian governors are mourning. Uh, but below here, you have this adult on 14, jostle to replace Ndiomu as Amnesty Boss. That's another story um, happening in the Niger Delta. Israel, Hamas war death toll hits 9,400. 9,400. Oh. That's it. We'll leave it there for the leadership newspaper. Hmm. Well, on that checkpoint story, I, I well, just first to say that the Israel-Hamas war is one of the things we're looking at this morning. Uh, so we'll ask you to stay tuned for a little more analysis on that particular story if, if there is an end in sight to, you know, what is happening in the Middle East and what solutions there could be. That's something we're going to be considering here. But in terms of the checkpoint, I do know that uh, the Honourable Member from Badagri um, with the House of Representatives has also taken that matter up in the House of Reps, you know. Because if we're talking about ease of doing business mm. and the federal government is very concerned about the ease of doing business and these are some of the things that are, you know, like taxation points for businesses, especially sometimes small businesses taking their goods from Badagri to... Uh, this is no, oh, but I go to even mainland Lin Lagos. Lin oh, okay. <laughs> it, it is, uh, you know, it is really something to worry about. I'm not saying that, you know, government uh, agencies tasked with uh, stopping smuggling or ensuring that people pay their relevant taxes shouldn't do their job. Mm -hmm. The question is, how many do you need on that road? But, Mark, but also, there has to be clarity between, is it revenue generation they are there for or facilitating trade? Yeah, big question. Those so two things need to be These are all the out. things that I know that the Honorable Member from Badagra, his name is Cecil Winga, uh, raised on the floor of the House of Representatives. So let us see how much they're able to follow through. Mm. Um, and I know that only recently, the federal government, uh, through the Presidential Enabling Business Council, released a report card of how government ministries, departments, and agencies are faring so far. Um, of the 53 participating ministries, departments, and agencies, only about 13 seem to be trying to do anything about obeying um, Executive Order 1, which has now been made into law, mm. uh, which is supposed to ensure efficiency and transparency. You can imagine, Nyota, out of 53, only about 13. The remaining 40 were happily scoring zero in some places. You, you know? say happily? Ha yes, happily, because, I mean, that's the only way. In other words, they were breaking the law effectively. So uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, now that we, you know, there is a little more focus on, on that to see, you know, precisely what it is that they're going to be doing differently. These are some of the practical ways that, uh, you know, businesses or uh, let's say gov government stands in the way of facilitating business. So let us, let us see what eventually happens. Maybe by the end of the year, we might be getting a different report. And, and, and how headlines like this help, you know, throw these issues to the fore. Well, we have with, with us this morning Daily Trust. Daily Trust is right here. Pay rise. Federal government yet to pay 79.3 billion naira peculiar allowance seven months after. Jusud ultimatum ends tomorrow. Supplementary budget stalls payment in agencies. NLC alleges lack of capacity to manage wages. Finance Ministry, mum. Okay, so page four is where you find details. If people have been promised a wage increase to help with this um, uh, removal of fuel subsidy, mm. they've been promised some, and the second seven months to implement it. Will we blame them when they go on strike? Will there be legitimate grounds for that? The big question, page four is where we'll find details. Uh, we also see here, bandits kill only teacher in Kaduna community. All right, I mean, if so that is not... what to the children there? There's that one is not teacher they have. One teacher in a community, and maybe that's the only teacher in that community, and that teacher has been killed. 
I mean, if that's not effectively saying Boko Haram, in other words, book is forbidden. I don't know what else it is saying. You have a number of other stories right there. Power minister yet to give policy directive. After two months in office, there are some ministers that, you know, you have to ask, you know, precisely where are you going, Minister, Mr. Minister for Power? Do you know, you have an idea? Have you studied the place well enough? And then you have to ask whether the president... How quickly is he going to be assessing his ministers? Oh, I, I You don't. know, 48 of them. What are the KPIs that they have to deliver on? I mean, some ministers look like they already know what to do mm. and they're hitting the ground, you know, running. Some of them almost flying. But this is what the Daily Trust is highlighting. In fact, to even get him from what I understand, it's been a job of work. Power minister yet to give policy directive. After two months in office, the power minister, if it's too much for you, please, you cannot afford learners on the job. That would, the time. that would be a miracle to hear him say, probably, I want to step aside. Okay. Well, if he doesn't want to say it, I think that he, he was appointed by somebody who can be, begin to say, this is when I expect, you know, first assessment, KPIs, uh, the deliverables. Mm. Uh, uh, well, what you also see here... The, at the bottom strip, something that we've raised over and over again. Many fear dead as boats with over 100 passengers capsizes in Taraba. We've raised the issue of safety and how safety, a uh, lack of attention to safety, seem to be costing us more lives than security. And it's something that we need to pay attention to. 100 people in Taraba, just like that in one fell swoop over something that could have been avoided. Let's leave it there for daily trust. Very sad uh, commentary there, Malkwe, no doubt, uh, because the same story is on the front page of uh, the Nigerian News Direct this morning, even though it's not the lead story. And it's who, who has left undone what they need to do? Who is checking whether these uh, things, uh, you know, are done? People don't really... One of the things that we understand is that people are supposed to use life jackets when they are on atop the water, but in some cases we've heard, particularly in the South-South, some people don't like using the life jackets, but hey, it's your life at risk. The lead story of the front page, on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct this morning is something cheery, I might say. And um, it's FG targets $2 billion investment from CNG conversion program. That story is on page six, beg your pardon, page four. And guess what? The rider gives something even more cheering. Over 1 million CNG vehicles to be delivered by 2027. 1 million CNG vehicles to be delivered by 2027. Something cheery, I might add, and uh, you can just imagine the business, the economic value chain that will benefit from that. And it seems that uh, the Ogun State government is interested one way or the other, right above the nameplate, Ogun to launch CNG mass buses today. Stories on page two of the paper this morning. And um, right beside uh, the picture on the front page, as local refineries prepare to commence oil production, NUPRC warns of supply shortage. What is this again? Uh, on the one hand, we're saying we're not producing, we're not refining our own products, and now we're hearing that there could be supply shortage. What, what supply shortage? Is it the, the crude oil or the, the, the refined products? Well, maybe page 12 of the Nigerian News Direct this morning will give you more details. And then right under that picture, counterterrorism. FG meets with Turkey to fast-track delivery of helicopters. Details of that story you'll find on page 3 of the Nigerian News Direct this morning. And so many others. Well, a few other stories on the front page. Okay, so there's that one that's also making the news. Or your government files suit to upturn judgment sacking Shaw of Obumo Shaw. Yes, uh, Markwe, thank you for um, helping that young man to understand that that word is Shaw of Obumo Shaw. Thank you very much. That's the Nigerian News Direct this morning. You know, I, uh, let's, if I wanted to start, I'll start out with that story. What's the exciting 
What's exciting about 1 million uh, CNG vehicles by the year 2027? What's so exciting about it? I mean, we're talking about the situation as we speak right now of uh, hardship in transportation and people can hardly buy fuel for their vehicles right now. The refineries are still not working there. They say by the end of the year, at least one of them will come on stream. And you're talking about 2027, four years or three plus years down the line. So we wait for a million vehicles. I think we can do a lot better than that. It's, it's a good thing to hope for, but we can do a lot better than one million vehicles by 2027. But having said that, let's go to New Telegraph. And New Telegraph leads with this story. Oppositions conduct a government of national unity. That's what they lead with. Oppositions conduct after Supreme Court verdict. Oppositions conduct after Supreme Court verdict will determine Tinubu's decision. Who's speaking? Marafa. And you'll find that on page 2, 3, and 31. New Telegraph is what I have here. APC's petition to the NBA confirmation of planned intimidation, harassment of our leaders. That's coming from the Labour Party. And allow Tinubu to concentrate. Olubadon pleads with opposition parties. That's the story, the lead story on New Telegraph. And we'll leave it at that. There are many other stories, but we'll leave it at that. I think we still have a Daily Times now, and uh, they have this showdown looms as NLC Uzodima lock horns Wednesday. That's a lead story. We'll hold him responsible if anything happens. Uh, that's the front page of Daily Times for you. Uh, government uses fierce coercion on state labor leaders, it says. Blatant lie, labor governor close. Uzo Dimma spokesperson. NLC wants federal government stabilize Naira or the story is somewhere on the front page right there. Uh, we're looking to hear from uh, the Nigeria Labour Congress today as we discuss this matter in Imo State because they have also threatened that they will not participate in any conversation with the federal government or even uh, on, uh, is it on the Imo issue if the Minister for Labour is a part of it, as a Minister for uh, Labour, Simon Lalong. Why? I, I, I don't know. According to them, I mean, when we listen to the reason, I think our producers might be able to get us that videotape um, of the NLC president saying that they do not want the minister and then talking about Imo State and saying that pensioners have been, you know, starved and, and, and you said like ghost workers when they're not ghost workers. Um, but it's in IMO, so with regards to IMO, you do not want to see the federal government minister. I, it, I'm not quite clear on, on, on how that is, you know, how that is related. But that's what we have um, on the front page of the Daily Trust. That's what it's looking at for you. Showdown looms as NLC Uzodima lock horns Wednesday. And then look at that, Nigeria to Houston direct flight soon. That's according to the federal government. Do you know something we don't? <laughs> well, they always say that government has more information than us, so maybe something is about to start. Something's in the offing. Something's in the air, literally. <laughs> <laughs> something's about to happen. Something in the air, literally. Uh, you also see the shown judgment. Confusion grips or your over conflicting verdicts from same judge. State government was set to hand allow a staff of office. Appeal court may settle matter. Legal <sighs> team assembled. I imagine that's what they're trying to say there. And you see that Nigeria is sick because lawbreakers treated with kid gloves. That's according to Olu of Worry. APC stalwart warns weakest critics. That's also right there. And PDP national wo women leader dead. Patty mourns. Uh, this was one story that also made the rounds yesterday. Professor Effa Atto, uh, woman leader of the PDP. Uh, she, she died, she passed on yesterday. May her soul rest in peace. I mean, I, I'm, I had cause to meet her. More than once mm. um, in the course of the in the course of her political career, especially after she became a woman leader of the PDP, and I can say that that was one woman 
really inspiring. Really inspiring. You do not have to be. She was very. Uh, I don't want to say quiet, but she was easy going, soft spoken, but very, very firm when she spoke. She was. She spoke with conviction, and she didn't just speak for her party. She spoke for women everywhere. So it's really sad to see that you know. Um, is gone. Uh, well, we pray that her legacy continues to live on. Mm -hmm. um, and also that the things that she fought for, because oftentimes when you fight for women's causes, not just for, you know, a party's causes, women's causes in general, that those causes will continue to be furthered. And, and that at some point she will be uh, remembered for good yeah. in terms of all that she has been able to push for especially in the political space for women. Uh, I think we can leave it there for Daily Times. And indeed. Indeed, we'll leave it there for a look at some of the papers and what they have said. So as Daily will be back in a moment, we stay with us. Even with the judgment, it, it is very clear that Nigeria has a long way to go in terms of ensuring that credible elections are conducted, elections that will be devoid of acrimony, elections that uh, all of us will be proud of. Judges are not suited to determine the winners of election. That is a job that is exclusively reserved for INEC if things are done properly. And that is why we must put an end to the shame that has become our Lord in terms of conducting elections. We recorded the highest number of pre-election cases this year, 1,878. The federal courts for several months couldn't handle any other case because the National Assembly, again, outside the provisions of the Constitution, decided to task the federal High court, you know, with the enormous responsibility of dealing with pre-election matter. And why did that happen? Party shiftings in the majority of the political parties put the Electoral Act aside and decided to impose candidates on the electorate. So many aggrieved persons went to court. In 2019, we had about, I think, 750 pre-election cases. And those are the guys who are challenging INEC for not conducting good elections. So the members of the Nigerian political class would love to be tasked by the Nigerian people. We have to be challenged by the Nigerian people. Whether they want democracy or autocracy. Whether they want popular democracy as opposed to bourgeois democracy. Whether they want maximum participation of the Nigerian people as opposed to, you know, participation in the election by a few money bags. And we're staying with the Supreme Court judgment on the PDP Labour Party appeals relating to our electoral laws and Nigeria's electoral system, the reasons behind the decisions of the justices and how it will play out eventually with Nigeria's electoral processes and the nation as a whole. And joining us to look at all of this is Mr. Yemi Candidate Johnson, a senior advocate of Nigeria. He joins us virtually. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Candidate Johnson. Joining us. Sir Campbell Johnson. Any assistance? Sir Campbell Johnson. Any assistance? Any assistance? All right. If you can hear, if you can hear me there, let's let's start off from that point. The yes, the judgment of the Supreme Court's come forward, and borrowing the words of the president to the German Chancellor, um, he said 
the distractions are over. It is now time to change the negative narratives around Nigeria, move this nation forward. Let's start off from there. What's your take? Well, um, the process of election is always contentious. Um, it can be divisive, and therefore it's disruptive for the task which should follow an election, which is governing. And so I think the president is right. The electoral process having gone to its legal conclusion with the decision of the course, the final decision as to the validity of the election, I think it's fair to say that the task outstanding now is to build Nigeria, to govern Nigeria, and to put its best foot forward. So if your, your, your colleague, Mr. Falano, said something there. He said, the, he put it this way, the burdening of the courts. He, he implying that the courts are overburdened with some of these things that can be settled outside of court. Um, let's look at a bit of history here. The U.S. president, former U.S. president Nixon, says that if, and like, if his presidency was going to be decided by the courts, then there's no point for him going into it. That was before he became president eventually. But how did we get to this point where practically all the elections in Nigeria are decided by the court. Can we get out of that space? It's a problem. In the UK, um, which was a colonial power in this country for many years, there has been one election petition in the last 150 years. Um, you are right to refer to Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon considered that if he were to challenge the election, even though the 1960 election turned on less than 80,000 votes, that it would affect the credibility of the presidency. He felt it was important to preserve the presidency from the potential delegitimization that would arise from an undue challenge. You know, an election is about the majority of votes. Uh, I think that this is something that people should recognize, and people need to recognize that you, you can lose the majority of votes. The problem we have in Nigeria is that the courts have given credence to the idea that on any number of technical grounds, the will of the people expressed at the ballot can be upturned. It's happened in many cases. In that case, um, political gladiators are encouraged to go to court and to look for the slightest, the most arcane legal or technical point to raise in the hope that the courts will give them authority to take the people's mandate. This is a misconception of the role of the courts. It is damaging to the credibility of the courts. It is damaging to the efficiency of the system of justice because, as Mr. Fallon rightly pointed out, civil cases, criminal cases, which are the ordinary fare of courts, are disrupted when thousands of, of cases are brought before judges who are then uprooted from their ordinary day-to-day -day jobs and are asked to decide election petitions. It is not the job of judges to decide the winners of elections. The challenge of INEC is logistical. The people's voice should be heard by counting their votes. The task of INEC is to create a logistical system by which those votes can be collected and can be presented in a way that is, will be favorably viewed by those, even those who have lost. In any dispute, if an impartial arbiter is administering a, a dispute, the test should be what the loser thinks. If the loser has no reason to complain, then the system has succeeded. This is the problem. So it's not for the courts to decide. But the, the challenge remains for INEC um, as the administrative body to improve its logistics and legal framework so that people will walk away knowing that they have been heard, but the people have decided this is really the test. Well, indeed, I mean, that is simply the, the test. And if INEC had been able to conduct elections in a manner that was acceptable to all of the parties, uh, I doubt very strongly. I, I do not know if you think that we will not go to court. And I, I, I don't know if you see a day uh, first. Uh, maybe, maybe that's one thing to say. Do you see a day where we will be able to conduct elections in this country and there will be no reason for political parties and politicians to go to court? Do you think that day is anywhere anytime soon? You know, in any election, somebody is going to be disappointed. This is the fact. Um, and disappointment is not a reason to disrupt political activity and the process of governance by bringing a challenge. Not every challenge has any me has merit. Not every challenge has substance. I mean, we've talked about the examples in foreign countries. The idea that you can bring any challenge, no matter how remote, no matter how technical, before the courts, is what lends credence to this disruptive behavior. And I consider it disruptive. Uh, to, to be fair, 
um, it's a good opportunity for lawyers to earn money. But earning of money is not the purpose of the justice system. The purpose of the justice system is to regulate all areas of human activity in a way that promotes the safety and the progress of society. So in the present case that we have, you talk about a presidential election petition. There are important things that Nigerian people need to be done on their behalf. The work of governance is important. Politics is about creating solutions and solving people's problems. If a government is fighting for the next two years or, or, the, or, or, or even the last 18 months, a crisis of legitimacy imposed by petitions which have a very slight chance of success, then that is a necessary disruption. And the court should not encourage this. But let, let it be said, INEC can improve and it ought to improve. Um, the complaints of individuals, even if they have lost an election, is valid because it allows us to concentrate on the efficiencies and the effectiveness of the system of conducting elections. That is important. But however, it's not every case that parties should feel they, they can roll the dice and maybe some judge or some group of judge, judges will be favorable to allowing a technical ground for obtaining uh, the, the people's will. It'll be interesting to see, you know, just how uh, matters proceed. And some people will always say, well, it's always better for politicians to approach the court than to take matters into their own hands or to encourage their supporters to take laws into their own hands when they feel hard done by. But I, I want to, you know, look at the Supreme Court judgment itself. Um, be before we... Before the court cases started, I think we had invited you on the program and you had given us your own analysis uh, of what you thought might transpire um, in the court and, and what grounds uh, of appeal that the, the candidates and the political parties might have. Uh, but looking at what has transpired at the highest court in the land, would you say that the judgment that has been given has been given on the substance of the matter or would you say that they have been given mostly on technical grounds? I would say that in this case, the judgment has been given. Well, the challenges that were made were largely technical. So, of course, the court has to resolve technical problems, technical questions. I do not see in any of the petitions a case made that the petitioner won the majority of votes and satisfied the Electoral Act for complying with the right to be declared as president. Uh, the, the substance of this petition was as to interpretations of the Constitution over 25% in Abuja, um, questions of the, of the qualification and the competence of the individual candidate, in this case, the president of Nigeria. So I think, and this is consistent with what I said earlier on, the idea that the slightest and the most arcane technical point may be brought and, and may have a chance of obtaining an election is very dangerous. The question a court should ask itself when faced with an election petition is this. What is the purpose of this election? The purpose of election is to determine how the majority of people have voted. This is the issue. And the principle should be that whoever has the highest number of votes should be declared the winner. Uh, I've seen cases in the past where the person who won the highest number of votes has lost the election in a court case to somebody who didn't. That is anti-democratic. This undermines public confidence in the democratic process. Because people have to understand that if you lose an election, you try another day. This is normal. But the idea that you may find solace in the courts on a ground which is not questioning the will of the people, but rather some construction of law, I think is dangerous, and, and this and this is a problem that I that I hope that the, the clarity that comes from the number of decisions we've had over the years, including the present case, should remove certain technical questions from contest. And people should say, well, there's no point in raising this point. The Supreme Court has decided it, and that's the point. And to go back to the point you made earlier on, um, election petitions are part of the electoral process. They are contemplated within the electoral law. And it is indeed an investment in steam control. Because after a disappointed party loses an election, it is better for him to go to a legal process. And that legal process, even by the time that it takes, 
allows passions to cool, allows people to consider the better interests and, and their better judgment as to what to do. So I think it's a very important to allow that opportunity. But I think that the, the disruptive effect on our politics, the disruptive effect on our ordinary day-to-day -day administration of justice is not tolerable or sustainable. Mm. While it is, I, I think a number of people, I mean, uh, maybe a, a majority of people, as a matter of fact, may agree with you in terms of, you know, how matters need to be decided on whether or not it is the will of the people. I mean, the will of the people was represented. Doesn't that also place like a very big burden on political parties to be certain of the candidates they are presenting, given the steep consequence they might pay um, if their candidates are found unworthy by even their own qualification? Uh, doesn't that, isn't that what we've seen so far in terms of uh, the emphasis laid on qualification, uh, laid on uh, you know whether or not they were suited in the first place, whether they met the criteria as stipulated by law. Yes, you're right. Um, political organization has failed in many of our political parties. The process by which candidates are selected does not appear to be one that um, will bear much scrutiny. It appears that uh, f from anecdotal evidence that there are many reasons beyond qualification, including corruption, including um, various um, sentiments, ethnic, religious, whatever. There are a variety of grounds on which candidates are chosen or preferred, which um, um, diminishes the obligation of parties to clarify the qualifications, the background of the candidates. You know, it's a responsibility of a party to present a candidate who is qualified, and it's their job of the internal organization to achieve this. It's also the job of your opponent to do opposition research and to determine well in advance of the election, who is going to face and what are the likely weaknesses in that person's qualifications. But then once those things are exposed and ventilated, if a person is qualified, then questions about character, questions about uh, you, you, the, the recent presidential election raises questions about whether a person was qualified by, by a certain university or whether he went to a certain school. If somebody is of weak character, and the opposition exposes this weak character, even then, it is for the people to decide. If the people want to decide, want to appoint somebody who has a tendency for dishonesty or for other types of misconduct, that is democracy. As long as they're not prohibited by law, which is the task that the parties must achieve, and they have not been doing to this time, then the people must be allowed to choose their candidates regardless of their character. You know, Mr. Johnson, that this matter of the people, um, a lot of people will still be wondering at what point the people's choice really comes to play. Because you said something earlier that the role of the courts or the role of the judiciary in our electoral process is already contemplated in the course of setting up the electoral laws. So if that role is already contemplated, at what, how well has it affected the perception of the courts or the judiciary in terms of negative or positive? Because if we look at our electoral process so far, it's been like the will of the people has been put to the, to the corner. You know, in the 2000 American election, this, um, as, as you know, this was highly contentious. This is the bush Gore election. Um, the famous quotation from Justice Breyer in that case, uh, Bush v. Gore, is that, that people may not know who won the presidential election of 2000. He says, but they won't. What, what is known is that the loser in this 2000 election is people's confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judges to decide their disputes. So it's a problem. When judges get involved, in party political matters and even in election matters, which are not party political, which, which are party political as well, their reputation is threatened because it is a field in which nobody's going to accept the outcome. Who, who are you, Justice X, to tell me that in Kogi West or in Oshobo South, we didn't win the election? We know we won the election, and that's all. And people are not going to accept a result 
that the judges give. The result that has to be accepted is the one that is demonstrated with force. I don't, I don't mean physical force, but I mean with compulsion on the ground. So, so this is this is the test. Uh, it's it, again to, to reiterate: it's not for judges to decide elections, but systems must be created, must be sustained, maintained, and we must work to create better systems, better systems which give us the assurance that the result that comes from the electoral umpire is one in which we can have confidence. Mm. Well, talking about better systems, one of the innovations that was introduced in the 2023 elections, um, and a lot of number of people were very optimistic, it wasn't just one, I mean, there were about two major, uh, you know, areas of technology introduced, not just in the Electoral Act, but also in terms of what INEC did, uh, the Beavis technology and also the IRA portal, which was supposed to entrench and engender transparency. And we saw what happened with the IREV on that day. And that was one of the grounds uh, which, uh, you know, the, the respondents went to court. Or like I said, the litigants now went to court. Um, and the Supreme Court had to rule on it. And they decided that the unavailability of election results on the IREV portal was not a ground to cancel the election. I think Justice Okoro uh, you know, ruled extensively on that. He said it was disappointing, and of course, it makes the elections less credible. Truth be told, he said, it makes the ele elections less credible, but it was not a ground uh, for the cancellation of the results. Does it take you back in any way to 2015, where we had the card reader, um, and the card reader, even though people saw... Yeah, there were some improvements in, in many areas, but in some other areas, uh, they saw irregularities. They could, they could see that as a result of the introduction of the card reader, the irregularities which some politicians tried to, you know, put in the system were, uh, will I say, were exposed. But because there was no law in, the card, uh, in our electoral act back then, back in the card reader, very little could be done by way of achieving justice, in quote. Do you see any similarities here between, even though now INEC is allowed to use whatever means it wants to use, electronically speaking, to, you know, uh, do conduct the elections. Do you see any similarities back then in 2015 and what transpired in the 2023 elections, especially when you look at the Supreme Court judgment on the use of the IREV? The Supreme Court judgment is correct. Um, the, the validity of an election is not affected under the Electoral Act by failure to utilize these advantageous technologies to which you have referred. It's the same thing in 2015. The court held that the card readers were not mandatory for use under electoral law. Uh, I'm not sure, I think that it may help. The purpose of IREV and BVAS is not to count votes, but to improve public confidence in the system of, of elections, and that is important. This is a major task. As I said earlier on, if the people accept the integrity and the efficiency of the electoral umpire, then they are more likely to have less reason to challenge election results. But at the end of the day, the primary evidence of an election result is the result sheet taken from every polling unit. IREF promised that those result sheets would be available to the public in real time. BVAS promised to verify the identity of those who would cast those votes. These are two measures that are important and which, by which technology will improve the credibility of our elections. But at bottom, nobody can, well, you can destroy paper, but if each party does its job and has representatives, polling agents at each polling unit, which each party boasts to have, especially in, in a presidential election. Now, the, the, the logistical uh, problems, the logistical undertaking of a presidential election is huge. Then the, the paper is the primary result. If you don't have uh, the IREV publishing election results, your agent should have the result. So this is the primary, primary purpose of that election result. We know what happens on the floor. All that IRF does 
is to broadcast to the world simultaneously what has happened. It's like somebody dying and you say, he's not dead until I've seen the obituary. Uh, they're two separate things. But then you're right. Um, in 2015, the legislature had not made provisions to encapsulate better technology, which would have improved the quality of our elections. And in 2023, they have not done so still. So we hope that the lessons from this election result and from the judgment in the petition, it, it's, it's quite scathing for the, for the court to say it doesn't apply, but then that's disappointing uh, to, to, to the, to, for the result and the credibility of the elections. So I hope that our legislature is listening, and if they're doing so, then they will modify the law to improve the measures, especially those that are available by technology, to improve our the credibility of our electoral process and the result that is produced at the end of the day. Well, what you just said now continues to reverberate in my mind, particularly in the light of a uh, word you used earlier, delegitimization. And that perhaps has also thrown up another conversation altogether in the entire process. A good number of people are saying, uh, you know, senior advocates such as yourself included, are saying that, look, what if we conclude all uh, issues around this before we swearing anyone. I think it was even uh, Professor Awaka Luese and who said, look, uh, was it him or someone else some, said something along the line of, look, let's see it as a competition. You don't get a prize until the entire race is completed. So uh, that's the way one of your you know, colleagues in the inner bar also put this. So would you also go with those who are thinking that perhaps the National Assembly should consider that all processes be concluded before anyone is sworn in, especially at the presidential or gubernatorial level. Some are proposing that all litigations be concluded, maybe we'll have elections maybe 10 months or even six months before, the, before May 29. And then after that, after whatever it is, all litigations are concluded before May 29 of the election year, and then the, the winner can be sworn in. What do you it's think? A it's an attractive proposition in some way. Um, but we have to recognize that one of the problems with elections being indeterminate for a long period of time is political instability, economic instability. There's a danger in a process which creates a vacuum in the executive authority of, of any country. So if you look at other examples, Kenya is a country where the election dispute was decided very quickly before the, the, the president was sworn in. Of course, uh, if you look at the petitions raised there, they are highly organized. The legal work has been done well in advance, and they are attacking specific issues which allow the court to decide very quickly. In America, you will recall in 2000, the Supreme Court stopped the counting in Florida because it would disrupt the election, the schedule, the constitutional schedule for electing, for appointing a new president. They were not going to allow disputation over the number of votes, the, the, the hanging Chad, the separated Chad. The veracity of the numbers in Florida in 2000 were sacrificed because of stability and because of the progress and of, of the nation. This is what is important. So you have to recognize that what a result, the, the, the getting the result in the quickest possible time is getting, getting the highest quality result is not always the most important factor. You have to think of bigger factors. I mean, people have obsessed about time this time because this election was so decisive. And many of the, of the, of the proponents of one candidate or the other felt that there was some advantage to be gained by preserving the continuity of executive governance in Nigeria. I think that where the balance is to be struck is something we would have to work on. I think it's important that there should not be a vacuum in power. And I think it's important that lawyers, I think Chief Clark said this as well a few days ago, the lawyers who do election petition cases have a lot of work to do. They have to prepare well in advance. And I'll give you another example, which I've given many times. Because the 2000 election in Florida decided the, two, the, decided the presidential election, in 2004, the Democratic Party, ahead of the 2004 election, sent 500 lawyers to Florida alone, six months before the election. Because you have to prepare, you need the foundation. You can't get up after an election 
You don't know how many agents you have. You haven't seen the polling, um, the polling results. You get a couple of lawyers together. Some are your friends. Some are not your friends. Some have done elections before. Some don't have logistical capacity. You cannot make a cake that is good to eat with poor ingredients. So at the end of the day, I think that the, the work of challenging election is so logistically taxing, not just legally taxing, that better preparation needs to be made even by those who would challenge elections. It's not a surprise that most election petitions do not succeed. Well, you know, the, something that you said also brings the same question or this point that has been made by some senior advocates of Nigeria, including mm -hmm. Professor Awakalu and uh, Mr. Kunle Adigoke to mind. Even mm -hmm. Mr. Bumulu Aliburua added his voice to that. Um, is, I mean, the impute or inclusion of technology. Um, one would have expected that with technology in the mix, everything would go, you know, okay. But then you also find a situation, and I'm glad that you mentioned what the Supreme Court said. I mean, what the, what the entire judgment of the Supreme Court revealed, that it is not about whether or not the, the winner was, uh, got the highest votes. You talked about the fact that it's largely on technicalities. And that's essentially saying, maybe the, we can say that the, elections, the election is went when the way it ought to go, but the technicalities around it are a little uh, more cumbersome. How do you think we can win that? Because that is essentially saying it is the politicians that are interested in ensuring that while the votes are there, we can go to court and make issues where there may or may not be issues. So is it a problem with the political class here or the electoral system itself or the people who are at the end of the day at the lower rung of the ladder, and whatever cases are raised at the courts, largely delegitimize whoever it is that is elected? First of all, I should say that um, technology can fail. Um, in, in 2020, America used the most cutting-edge technology for elections, and still today, there are people who still deny the result of that election. So at the end of the day, in a political contest, some people will never accept. Um, as, as to technicalities, I, I think that, again, the test is the number of votes. Who won the highest number of votes? Most election petitions, and this presidential election petition is a key example, the substance of the petitioners' cases were highly technical points which did not go to numbers. None of the petitioners claimed to have won the majority of votes. None of the petitioners claimed to have won the required spread that the Constitution makes mandatory for declaring a person properly elected under our Constitution. So, yeah, if you bring a technical case to the court, the court has to decide the legal question you put before them. The court can't... Uh, I think that, again, um, just the court quoted Justice Toby saying that the court does not go to the marketplace to search for evidence. If you have a case on facts, you bring a case on facts. If you have a case on arcane and technical questions of law, that's what you bring, and that's what the court will dispose. Uh, again, to repeat myself, when you bring these questions that are difficult for the ordinary man to understand, it's easy for them to take the view that the election result has been forged. It, delegit it delegitimizes the government. It makes the work of government and of, of an incoming administration more difficult. And this is something people need to discuss, to consider. To take the example you gave me at the beginning, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, who became president even though he lost the 96 election, decided quite rightly in the interests of his country that it would not serve the interests of America for him to challenge an election which he could well have challenged even on the numbers because he had a commitment to the stability of his country. And he was rewarded subsequently with his own election to the presidency. So um, parties need to, I think that part of the problem with our politics is that people go to, to seek electoral office for private gain. Uh. I think that is the problem. If you recognize that political leadership is a sacrifice, then you do it tentatively, uh, humbly, and with the desire that I have something to offer, and if it's not accepted, well, I will wait again. And the great leaders of the world have faced reverse and they've come back to get a better result. But our politicians see the prize as something that is going into their pockets. 
Mm. And this perhaps explains the, the psychological attitude that they take to loss. Well, it's a, it's a long conversation because this started long ago and God mm. knows how long it will take. But this has been quite uh, illuminating. Thank you so much for your time this morning. So, any candidate Johnson is a senior advocate. It's my Nigeria. pleasure. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time. We're back right after now to take on another issue. Do stay with us. That's what we want to discuss now. The NLC is to protest, uh, to begin a protest in Imo State over what it described as violation of workers' rights by the state government. Of course, uh, so you, you're part of what uh, the NLC president said at that meeting um, uh, was uh, allegations by the Imo State against the workers to include refusal to implement previous uh, uh, agreements, especially the accord reached on 9th January 2021, outstanding salary arrears of about 20 months, and a number of other issues. Let's have a conversation with um, the two representatives from both sides this morning. Chris Onyeka is Assistant General of the Nigeria Labour Congress. He joins us uh, virtually with Austin Chilakbo, who is Special Advisor to Governor Uzadema on Labor Matters is also a former chairman of Nigeria Labor Congress in Imo State. Mr. Chilapu, thank you both for joining us this morning. But let's begin with you, Mr. Chilapu. So this is where we are now. Um, first of all, what, how, what would you say to these allegations by the NLC against the Imo State government? Thank you very much. Uh, once again, like you said, uh, my name is Komne uh, in Chilapu. I was the immediate past chairman of Nigeria Labor Congress. Constitutionally, my tenure ended on the 7th of March, 2023. Yes, uh, it's my pleasure, and uh, I want to react to these allegations leveled against the Imo State government, which uh, I am the special advisor to the Excellency on labor matters. Number one, my appointment as SA Labor, this is the first time any gov governor in Nigeria decided to appoint a labor leader, special advisor on labor matters. That the single senator who appointed me as his special advisor means he's had the interest and welfare of the workers at heart. Because he knows that I'm a, build, I'm a bridge builder. In the first place, the said workers of Imo State are owed 20 months unpaid salaries. This means that from January 2022, to November 2023, no worker in Imo State have been paid salaries. This is absolutely lies. This is a way to give a dog a bad name in order just to hang it. The workers of Imo State not only earn their salaries as at venue, but earn 13th month salaries since the inception of Governor Hope, who's the March uh, administration in 2020. I want to let you know that every where can the governor pay the 13th month salary and at the same time you're owing salaries. You can see that these allegations is neither here nor there. No worker in Imo State is owed a fadden, as I'm talking to you right now, as a SA Labor and as a, a member of Nigeria Labor Congress. The allegation is neither here nor there. Look at a situation whereby the government of Imo State is being alleged that they have declared 11,000 workers ghost workers. I discovered this that maybe the leadership of the Congress have no records. It is on record that Governor Hope Uzodema has never sacked any worker since he came into power as the governor of Imo State. Mm. He has never sacked a single worker. All right. He it's... said he's even employing. Yeah. Mr. Chilaku, just one second. If you can this hear one me. will be just... testified. Then yes. you look at the check off dues they receive yeah. from unions that yes. are paid check off dues here as admin due. Well, just, just check one off second. dues of civil service unions have increased. Yeah. Let, let us have increased. Yes. Local government has increased. We hear the you, but can we take the opinion? Can we take it? Can you take, take the opinion of the, uh, you know, uh, your, the person who is also on this panel with you? Mr. Onyoka, you've listened to uh, the side of the government on this matter, that maybe the NLC does not have its uh, facts right and that there is no such thing as outstanding arrears of up to 20 months. 
Are there other things or uh, are, they, are the facts being mixed up somewhere? Um, I, I didn't get you very well. Uh, please, can you repeat the question? If can, that is for me. Okay, can you hear me can now? Can you hear can me you well hear now, Mr. Nyeka? Okay, I hear you. Okay. okay. You've listened you to, to uh, uh, Mr. Chilapo. How do you respond? They're very, very clear. Um, and I want to thank you for having me. And um, the comrade uh, SK to the state governor also knows the issues. And he knows, he knows the truth, which is not saying here. The facts are very, very clear. We have had agreements with this governor, even when Chilapo, Chilapo here, was the chairman. Uh, and uh, those agreements in 2021, January precisely, were part of the people that came for to sign that agreement was the present governor of Kedu State, was the deputy, uh, one of the deputy presidents of NEPS. And he came in conjunction with other neighbor leaders to sign an agreement with this governor, January 2021. Those agreements were managed. They were never fulfilled. What, were the con see, what the are the things contained? In, what are the things contained in that agreement? Is it, does it include this outstanding arrears of salaries? All of them. All those salaries we're talking about. And they are still, these there. issues are still outstanding as we speak. Yeah, they are, they are still outstanding. All of them are still outstanding. The governor has the penchant of declaring workers in his state ghost workers. There is an association today that exists in Imo State that is called Association of Unpaid Workers. If the governor has paid them, why would we have such association exist? Is this association so, known to the government of Imo State? Is this association yes. you're talking about, is it known to the government? Of course, it's not to the government of Imo State. In the local, I will tell you, I will give you an example. At the level of the local government, we documented about 1,180 workers as at March this year that were unpaid, documented, documented. And that was what led us to organize what we call workers' tribunal, where those affected would come to talk about this. You see, these issues are issues that affect our people. Okay. Well, <laughs> Mr. Onyeka, just one second. <laughs> uh, are these facts, this association that you mentioned, this workers' tribunal that you talked about, does Mr. Chilaku also know about him? Uh, Mr. Chilaku, he, he knows. He would claim not to know. Okay, let's, the let's ask him. Was yeah. even why Chilaku was, was still the chairman. Okay, let's Please go ahead and Chilaku. ask him. Let's ask him now. Mr. Chilaku, you, you are aware of these facts, yes or no? And what, how do you react to what Mr. Onyeka has said? I, I still went to maintain that there was nothing like that. But before this, let me react to, let me react to what he talked about, the issue of... Uh, agreement. By the time that so-called agreement they claim was written, I was the chairman of Nigeria Labor Congress. I never signed that agreement. As a chairman of the state, my signature is supposed to be in that agreement. I wasn't like that. Let him show you that agreement. They were commending the governor for paying salaries as that meant you. Go, I'll go through that agreement. You see it there. Well, you... How can you be speaking from both sides of the mouth? But you also the man heard you say that he's paying now. salary, you're commending paying salary as that men do, is the same man they are not accusing that he's owing salaries. Well, Mr. Yeka, you just heard that him say, I'm beg your pardon, Mr. Chilapu. go ahead and put their houses in order. Just one second. You heard him Any say now. Any association you claim that is formed by unpaid workers. Yes. I think this may be hired group. That's why people are saying that all these moves are politically motivated. Can, can you hear me now, Mr. If you're a local Mr. government Chilapu. worker, you are owed, you channel your grievances through no gain. Naturally, no local government employees. If you are a teacher, you challenge it through, through an EUT. If you are a civil servant, you challenge it through the National the, the, the Civil Service Senior. Anything outside it is an aberration. It's not part of what uh, a labor knows about. If the present labor is not beginning to listen to people that doesn't be at the NACI, uh, affiliates, I don't think it is right. As I'm telling you today, as I'm talking to you today, the government of Imo State has paid salary up to September. And by, tom by tomorrow next, October salaries will be paid, including pensioners. They are not owing anybody any salary in Imo State. 
If this is the basis, and let's say Abuja is saying that coming to Imo State, let them tell Imo people a different news. It's not you have not any understand. documents. No worker is being owed. Yeah, Mr. Chilapu, do you have any documents to confirm to NLC, both in Imo State and in Abuja, that all the facts that they are hearing and acting upon to the extent of organizing press conferences are false? I have the document. Look. Let me give you an instance. Have you had any engagement? Just one second, Mr. Chilaku, just one second. Have you had any engagement with okay. the NLC in Imo State so that all these issues that are of brewing course, yes, could I have do. been settled? Okay, so what, what was the result of, of it? Was Mr. Onyeka part of that meeting? I, Mr. Onyeka is not in charge of Imo State. Mr. Onyeka that is there is not in charge of Imo State. There is a secretary posted to Imo State and the leadership of NLC in Imo State. Onyeka is in Abuja. He can't be in Imo State talking about Imo matters. I mean, I'm engaging the leadership of labor in Imo. It has to be those that are in government as labor leaders in Imo State. I'm not one from Abuja. Onyeka should listen to us and listen very well on what is happening in Imo State. Okay. I am telling you emphatically that if he is claiming that workers are being owed, let him show you any letter from Norge. Okay. That is an affiliate of NSC that is in charge of local government workers. All right, just, that indicates just, that just one second, Mr. Chilaku. Let's ask uh, Mr. Onyeka now if he, can, if he has a response to the issues that you have raised. Mr. Onyeka, um, are there evidences to show that indeed the state government has not done the needful, which is get, which is getting the attention of uh, the NSC in, at the headquarters in Abuja? Mm -hmm. Mr. Onyeka. Issues, we have networks. Our networks are very clear all over, all over the Federation. We have affiliates, and we work on what our affiliates tell us and the information they get, they get to us. The Imo State issue, I am well abreast of the Imo State issues because I've been involved in it for a long time. Um, the governor of Imo State has so cowed the labor leaders in the state, you know, to the extent that he has cloned the Nigerian Labor Congress in Imo State. He has created his own, his own Nigerian Labour Congress and insists that that particular Nigerian Labour Congress will be the one that he works with in the state. The same way he has cloned some uh, leaders of affiliates in the, in the state to use them to work against the workers in the state. So essentially, this Mr. Onyeka, is very clear. Yeah. You can ask, just, you can just, ask the yeah. Honorable SK. Yeah, just, just, just one ask second. The Honorable SK. He can hear How you. Did he leave off you? Yeah. Ask the Honorable SK, how did he leave office? as the chairman of the Nigerian Labour Congress. He abandoned his position because of threats from the state governor. The state governor threatened him and he felt he had to flee for his life. We reported that issue to the International Labour Organization. So you can ask him what led to his leaving. He did not leave office on March 7th. He left office far, far before March 7th because he had to abdicate his position. Well, because of the threat. Right, right now, uh, Mr. Onyeka, if you can hear me, right now, the, Mr. Chilapu is not the one that is on trial. Uh, it's the issues It's uh, between the NLC and the government of Imo State. What is interesting, uh, Mr. Onyeka, is that uh, Mr. Chilapu is a former chairman of the NLC, and he is also working with government right now. Isn't that supposed to be helpful, helping the cause of labor? Are you saying that Mr. Chilapu is not serving the interests of the workers on whose behalf he's Mr. expectedly Chilapu supposed to be in the government, working with the governor. Can you hear me, Mr. Onyeka? Okay. I was just appointed two months ago as a special advisor to the governor. After the governor has threatened him, intimidated him, and he abandoned his position as state chairman of NLC. He moved, he ran away because of the fear of his life. The governor now found... Oh, dear. Well, let, let's... Uh, we're rounding off now, so let's take a quick response from Mr. Chilaku. Well, Mr. Chilaku, you heard him, and they, he, they continue to maintain that there is a lot that is being hidden, not being made known, and consequently getting the attention of labor. How do we resolve this? How do you think? What do you think the government should do? do you, would you su suggest or advise the governor of Imo State to invite the members of the, the, the NLC in Imo State and as well as the federal, at, at the national level, so that these issues can be resolved and that these protests will not see the light of day and everybody will go peacefully and joyfully?
Thank you very much. Look, the governor of Imo State is very disposed in seeing labor. And I want to tell you that the governor sees labor leaders in Imo State at least once every month. He sees them. And how can the governor come to resolve issues when you are telling lies? Look at that. Tell us that uh, 10,000 pensioners are owed. On the 10th of uh, October, pensioners celebrated their, tent, uh, uh, their pensioners' day at their office. The national president of pensioners was physically present. The general secretary was physically present. And every other national executive member of pensioners were there. Okay. That day, the pensioner chairman, His Excellency, the single senator who opposed the member, was also physically present. All right. Well, Mr. Chilaku, what we can only hope... The the governor... Yeah. Just, just a second. Uh, because we're, we've completely due. run out of time right now, of Mr. Chilaku, officers. if you can hear me. So uh, we've completely so run out of time. Uh, and, you know, but the issues seem to be absolutely unresolved right now. So what we can only hope is that Labour and government will take this opportunity to have this conversation so that you know, governance is not disrupted by whatever action Labour decides to take. Uh, Austin Chilapo is special advisor to Governor Uzodema on labor matters. He's also a former chairman of Nigeria Labour Congress in Imo State. We've also had uh, Mr. Chris Onyoka, who is Assistant General Secretary of the Nigeria Labour Congress. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this morning. So we're back right after now to take on another issue. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us all the while. Well, the Israeli-Palestine, Israel-Palestine conflict continues unabated, it would seem, with Israel's Prime Minister quoted as saying the war in Gaza is going to be long. But you see, Nigeria and more than a hundred other UN member states have voted for immediate humanitarian truce in Gaza. What does this imply? Because Gaza's health ministry says the to death toll among Palestinians in the Hamas-Israel conflict has crossed, depending on whose figures you are looking at, between 8,000 and 9,000. Most of them, unfortunately, women and minors. Professor Femi Otsubanjo joins us this morning. He is a research professor of international relations and strategic studies at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us this Thank morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Do you even think, um, first of all, generally, there are calls, depending on who, whose interests is at risk? Exactly. Do you think people even understand what the issues are? It's, a very, it's been yes. on for decades. Yes. It's uh, the world's most intractable conflict. Uh, it's been on since 1948, 75 years, uh, when the British trustee mandate was ended in the, what was formerly part of the Ottoman Empire. And um, two states were created by resolution of the United Nations, 181. Uh, but uh, the, the state of uh, Israel for the Jews and Palestinian for the Palestinian for the Arabs, but the Arabs rejected it. They rejected the idea of creating Israel within their own territory and have uh, continued to reject it. They have fought several wars, uh, and uh, unfortunately, those wars ended up entrenching Israel rather than uh, fulfilling the, ob the objective of removing Israel. And we are still at it. Uh, uh, it is a clash of nationalisms. Uh, a lot of history, which anybody can tell, history sometimes is the account of the victor. Uh, but the, really, uh, we have Palestine, Palestinian nationalism versus uh, Jewish nationalism clashing. And uh, the world has not been able to find a way of separating them because everybody is taking some kind of uh, uh, has some kind of interest in, in the matter. Uh, for 75 years, the world has tried to solve the problem, but it's not, it's not been resolved. And uh, this particular one uh, is a response. This particular uh, uh, outbreak of violence is a response by Hamas 
to the, what you call the Abraham Accords that uh, the United States had been mentoring between some Arab countries, a few of them, Bahrain, UAE, uh, Morocco, and Sudan, and Sudan have signed some kind of accord. But interestingly, those accords, do not, the, 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 the content did not mention Palestine once. And that means that <laughs> the Palestinians are being sidelined, being forgotten. And I think Hamas is trying to remind the world that the Palestinian problem remains and has not been solved, and therefore trying to discredit that accord. And it's done so, it's doing so effect effectively, because in those ways it has dragged Israel into a quagmire. Israel is in a quagmire. Israel has lost, it's already lost the public opinion, the international opinion, the propaganda war. And it's going to be dragged into an, a dangerous urban warfare. It's okay for Israel to drop all these bombs from the air, by the time you enter Gaza, it's a different ball game. And there's no amount of power. The, the Nazis tried it in the siege of Stalingrad, sent their best troops and all that, they were destroyed. So I think Israel will not have an advantage in a grand war. And the alternative is to now destroy from the air. And that, that destruction will be shown to the world. The world will resent it because it is indiscriminate destruction of both military and civilian killing women, old people, and so on. But isn't that the way even start, uh, Hamas even started in the first place? Yes. You know, air raid and all of that, yes. which, which jeopardized the lives of uh, Israel? Yes, you know, quite honestly, you know, my, my idea is not to say, to blame one side or the other. But uh -huh. the, the truth of the matter is that in the human psychology, I mean, the Yoruba say, what is this in the book? Uh, when the fly is bite is flying all over you, nobody talks. But when they see you eating flies, that is the reality. When Hamas went, of course, people condemned it. Okay. But the, what they are seeing is a disproportionate response. Uh, Israel is threatening to destroy Hamas, which is an unrealizable objective, which is political hot air. It's not a military objective that can be realized. But it can be realized at the expense of the massive destruction of Gaza, which would totally alienate Israel from the rest of the world, mobilize Arab opinion and international opinion against it, and they make the old objective of fighting to be unrealizable. It's very interesting that yeah. these things, I mean, the way you are putting these yes. things, but you know, even the attempts that have been made beyond that mm -hmm. of the United Nations, the, you know, uh, the truce and everything that was called, I also remember that there was that handshake uh, between Palestine, mm -hmm. not Hamas, Palestine and Israel mm. in the days of uh, it was yes, Arafat when Bill Clinton was president, yes. where he invited them and you know they had this conversation, yes. they had a handshake and yes. all those things. Malcolm Begin was the prime minister of Israel. I'm wondering how, for God's sake, were we able to circumvent that kind of process because the whole world cheered at that time that if the two leaders could look each other in the eye and have a handshake, this was in 1993, how many, how many years ago now? 30 yeah. years ago now? Yes, yes. That one would have expected that that would have been it. Yes. Well, the reality is that Hamas' ideology is that of destruction of Israel. So not, is, that is not the, the ideology of Palestine. Palestine. Yeah, that's, the, that's the decision you want to make. It's not the ideology of the Palestinian people. But democratically, Hamas was elected to control Gaza. Whereas Mahmoud Abbas, Fatah, controls the West Bank. In fact, the moderate Mahmoud Abbas faction was thrown out of Gaza through uh, violence and military victory of Hamas. So essentially, Israel sees Hamas as a terrorist group that is actually explicitly devoted to its destruction. So Israel is not going to be comfortable. The destruction of Israel is the objective of Hamas and the groups like Hezbollah or Islamic Jihad. If you, how do you, how do you negotiate that kind of polar objectives in which Israel wants to survive and has the right to survive, Hamas wants to destroy it. Hamas is not just content with creating a Palestinian state. It goes beyond that objective. And that is where the problem is. Hamad, uh, Mahmoud Abbas faction has become most helpless in the matter. So how, how did Hamas itself 
you know, come to be. Because yes. in the, all of the conversations since 1948 that you mentioned, yes. even as far back as 90, just yes. about 30 years ago, yes. 1993, I'm not sure that Hamas is as prominent. In yeah, the because that, Hamas is the product so, of a split in the Palestinian liberation movement. You know, there have been a lot of infighting. Uh, people with different perspectives. You, uh, remember, uh, our Sadat was assassinated because he signed a peace treaty with Egypt. That is a kind of uh, ideological uh, conflict that you find within any organization. And then, of course, it, it leads to fractionalization. And I must grow out of that uh, disenchantment with the options that the PLO was offering and created his own extremist uh, uh, commitment to destroy Israel, as opposed to Mahmoud Abbas Fatah, which really was ready to compromise. So where do we go from here, Prof? Yeah. What, what are the, because it seems like even political solutions are failing. Yes. So yes. where do we go from here? Well, there's nothing, we, we have to go back to political solutions, because first, you cannot, you cannot solve this problem through uh, the military option. If you destroy, if you take over the whole of Gaza, then you still have the West Bank. That means you increase militancy in the West Bank, which, of course, will be taken over by Hamas. If, if Hamas cannot defeat Israel, let us not uh, make any mistake about that. Israel may be able to destroy, but it cannot destroy, it may be able to destroy physically the environment of Gaza and all that, through bombardments and all that. But it cannot destroy the ideology. And ideology is not something you shoot down. Yeah? So you, how do you go about it? You, we, the whole world has to be involved. You know, the Arab League has not done the best that it should do. In fact, because it has, the Arab world is filled with all these feudalistic, uh, uh, autocratic governments that are very fragile and depend on basically the United States for survival, mm. they have not been able to put pressure on uh, these terrorist groups, or what we call liberation groups. I don't think we should be fair to call them terrorists because they are nationalist groups as well. Mm. They, may have, uh, they might adopt terror tactics to come to, uh, to uh, some kind of accommodation. Israel's greatest fear is that an independent Palestine will be controlled by Hamas. It will be taken over by Hamas, and Hamas that is dis committed to destroying it will then have some kind of leeway uh, to do so. Well, you, you put it quite fairly when yeah. you said the Hamas is not just a physical uh, infrastructure of yeah, people, no, it it's is, an ideology. It's an ideology, yes. Now, this ideology is extreme. Yes. But then it is also interesting that this ideology, um, one way or the other, is getting some kind of sentimental support, support yes, 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 so, yes. But it's also, you know, cheering to know that Nigeria has taken the position of humanitarian um, um, perspectives. Mm. Uh, Professor Bolaji Akinyemi has suggested that Nigeria should remain neutral in all of this and not take sides. Yes. Do you agree with him? Yes, uh, well, there's nothing to, no side to take. Uh, uh, because a lot of Nigerians think that it's a religious thing. Uh, Christian. There's only 1.6% 1 1 Christian of Christians in, in Israel. There are more Muslims. There are 21% of Muslims, in, Palestinian Muslims, in Israel, the state of Israel. So it is not about religion. It's about working out an accommodation. The Palestinians deserve freedom. They deserve their own human rights. They deserve to have a state. Israel deserves to survive. You have to balance this. How do you do it? You know, you have to remove all these powers. In fact, it is a clash of powers, sometimes a clash of civilization. And all this Saudi Arabia and Iran regional powers who are sponsoring all this uh, uh, violence, the United States that supplies all the weapons and uh, continues to oil its own military industrial complex, the Jewish lobby that it wants to satisfy. There are too many factors. But the, the two-state solution it's, there's no alternative to but it. This two state solution yes. conversation has been known, as you said, since yes. 1948. Yes. 75 years, you said. Yeah, it was, in fact, the initial solution because the United Nations wanted to create Israel and a Palestinian state. But the Arabs rejected it and started fighting until Israel took over those territories that should have been part, should have formed the nucleus of a Palestinian state. The problem with the two-state solution so far is that the, the, uh, even 
Fatah, which is the moderate faction of Mahmoud Abbas, is saying that it must be a, Israel must be a binational state. It's true. Whereas you have one state for the Palestinian, you are going to have a state in which the Palestinians are integral part. They are even seeking the right of Palest the right of return, what they call the right of return, that Palestinians can return to Israel. And of course, that will dilute the Jewishness of the Israelis and Israelites are not uh, well. interested in that. There's also the problem of how can you reform Hamas if you have an independent Palestinian state? Can you keep out Hamas from taking over power? And if it takes over power, will they still be committed to the destruction of Israel? Questions, questions, questions. Yeah, yeah, yes. I thought you were coming to ask questions, but <laughs> clearly the questions are limitless. Yes, and uh, we, we, keep, we can only hope that, you know, as time goes by, these issues will be resolved. We'll keep our eyes on them and probably have you some other time to discuss this. Yes. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank Professor you for Fendi asking. Banjo is a research professor of international relations and strategic studies at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs in Lagos. Nyata. Thank you, Ayo, and thank you, Prof, for coming up, Professor Femi Otubajo. But we'll just go on quickly to our correspondent, um, Charles Apurum, who's in River State, to bring us an update on the situation there. We understand there was a special emergency session or sitting of the State Assembly where the Speaker um, outlined some of the issues that they had. He talked about um, the removal of the leader of the House, um, Honorable Edison, are here for supervising the burning of the hallowed chambers and then the notice of the impeachment of the governor for what they consider lack of performance, though he's believed to be still loyal to the, his predecessor. Um, Honorable Ahi, Ahi was removed from his position as House leader in that emergency session. Now the also, the so let's bring in Charles Opum, our correspondent in River State, to bring us up to speed. Hello, Charles. All right, let's let's just we'll just take a listen to what happened in the in that session, emergency session of the River State House of Assembly. Now, those that voted in favor of the removal of Edison A as the majority leader of this house, twenty-three abstention nil against deal. By that result, Edison Ehi is now removed as the majority leader of the River State Assembly in line with our standing orders. Okay, so, uh, well, you heard that. That was the Speaker of the River State House of Assembly announcing the removal of the majority leader in the House. But, Charles, are you there now? Can you bring us up to speed what's going on in River State? What happened? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm standing along Moscow Road here in Port Harcourt, And behind me, of course, is a heavy barricade of security operatives. Now, for some context, Moscow Road is where the River State House of Assembly is located. Is also where the River State Police Command Headquarters is located as well. And of course, the NNPC, the Court of Appeal, amongst other buildings. So it's a very, very significant part of Now, last night we were inundated uh, by the first that had been burnt down, but the fire had actually taken place and the Hallow Chambers itself was burnt. Now, I mean, as at 10 45 p.m., there were over 17 police vehicles. Running up this street on this side, where there's a, a BHDC office that needs to end this street, and on the other side, where is River State Secretariat, the Protocol Development Area, and of course, uh, the Rivers High Court, they're all on the other side. You can't actually gain access into this particular stretch of Moscow Road because of the heavy security presence. Somehow, we managed to get entrance, and there was an emergency. When we entered the Rivers House of Assembly, it was born so we increased. But the Speaker of the House, uh, Right Honorable Mark Zamiwi, alongside 23 other lawmakers, sat in the in the conference hall, like uh, some sort of auditorium somewhere, you know, which was not their usual sitting place. It was an emergency sitting, yeah, an emergency sitting, and there were three items as uh, listed out by the clerk of the House. Item one was the suspension of uh, the House leader, Right Honorable Edison Ehi, 
who the Speaker of the House accused of supervising the burning of the Hallow Chambers on the instructions of the River State government. That was, I'm, I'm quoting him very briefly. The second, of course, was, uh, the second item was the suspension of Edison A. Game, uh, Sokari George, uh, Jumbo, and a host of other, about five of them were suspended just today, less than 30 minutes ago, uh, during their emergency meeting. And then, most crucially, the third item of the agenda was the impeachment of the governor of Rivers, uh, Dr. Sinala Yukara. And that impeachment proceeding started today. But during the process, just the moment the impeachment proceeding started, you know, we started hearing gunshot outside, uh, shooting of tear gas and all of that. And um, the lawmakers, they finished the first process uh, and they jumped into their vehicles and they fled the House of Assembly complex. So there was a lot of shooting of tear gas outside. I had to leave my from, you know, and come and stay here, uh, which is at a safe distance. But I understand that the governor himself has actually arrived at the House of Assembly complex, accompanied by the House leader, Honorable Medicine Ege, who is believed to be loyal to the current governor. So that is the situation right here on the floor of the House. It's different the other. So as as we uh, we do understand that there were they all had okay from your report now the members of the state assembly have left the chambers or the complex completely. Oh well, we do hope it will come back real quick. But there's this um, story out there on the social media space that the, the governor was being shot at by the police. Um, I was hoping that Charles will help us answer that question and confirm before the truth of the government. But this is a matter I'm sure that we'll keep, we'll keep tabs on and keep the people updated on what's going on in River State as we go along. Indeed, it's a developing story, um, and certainly all eyes will be on River State today, bringing you details as you've heard them. But a summary of what has happened, uh, the leader of the House of, uh, the State House of Assembly, Honorable Ahis, Edison he has now been removed as the leader of the House, and the Speaker, Martins Amewule, is accusing him of supervising the burning of the Chamber of the House of Assemblies. We'll keep you posted on developments. We understand that uh, there's been an impeachment notice served for the Governor as a result of a fallout between himself and his predecessor, who is the current minister of the Federal Capital Territory. How that is panning out um, is something that, you know, what has caused this is, is what is unclear. Uh, but we certainly will keep tabs on it and keep you posted as events develop in Port Harcourt, the River State Capital. Thank you so much for watching this beautiful Monday morning. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. And I'm Neil Taigbe. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm Ayo Makinde. Bye for now.